reason, you know, a lot of North Jersey is dominated by New York. Curious, how many of you have ever been to New Jersey? Anybody ever go to New Jersey in your life? Okay. All right. I grew up in the southern part of the state, which, believe it or not, is more like Indiana than it would be New York. Uh, it's, it's farmland. I worked on a farm growing up. My job in the summer was stacking hay in the hay mow, um, work in the fields. I, we had cows and, well, later steers, but cows and... Um, uh, we raised corn and, and hay and that kind of stuff. So I, I literally worked on a farm as a kid. In fact, two friends had farms. Raised a steer to show in uh, 4-H. You know, so I was involved in that. Probably a lot similar to what you've grown up with than what you would think in New Jersey. I went to a little, well, not a little, a good-sized Christian school, Gloucester County Christian School in New Jersey, and uh, did not start off there, though. As a kid... My dad was a general contractor, and I was raised in a United Methodist church. And I don't know if you, if, and if any of you had a United Methodist background, they did not preach the Bible. The only scripture I ever heard on Sunday, we would quote the Lord's Prayer together, the Lord's Model Prayer. That was it. The, the minister wore the black robe with the collar and yeah, very formal, did not preach the Bible. So I didn't even hear John 3.16 until I was 10 years old. I'm about to tell you that story, if you can imagine. So not even in church. I didn't, I didn't hear from our church anyway. So I, I remember I was nine. My dad's a general contractor. We're standing at the end of our street. We have eight houses on our street. It's a dead-end street. And down at the end of the street is a huge area of woods. There's a creek that runs through it. It had rained for days on end, and our creek was flooded. So the creek's normally about a foot and a half deep. It was probably five, six feet deep, water churning. So my dad's ho holding my hand. I'm a little guy. And he says, uh, hey, bud. Yeah, dad? How about we get the rowboat and we'll go up to Uncle Stan's house three miles upstream and we'll ride the rowboat back to here. I wasn't sure that was a great idea. And I said, uh, I don't know, dad. He said, if you don't go, I'll take your sisters. <laughs> well, my sisters were five and seven years old at the time. So who wants to be shown up by their little sisters? Okay, Dad, so we grabbed the rowboat. We had a pram. It's a, it's instead of the pointed rowboat, it's the flat face rowboat. We put the pram in the back of the pickup truck. We went up to my uncle's house. My mom and sisters help us. We take the boat down to the edge of the water. My dad says, all right, honey, we'll see you at home. And he says, get in the front, Rich. I, again, I'm nine years old. We don't even have life jackets. I do not know what the man was thinking. And uh, my dad is six foot seven. And he weighed about 260 or so at the time. Now, I'm 6'6", six, six, I weigh about 240. So you figure my dad's 20 pounds heavier than me and an inch taller than me, right? So my dad sits in the boat. Well, I'm, I'm nine years old and I am not 240 pounds. So when my dad sits in the boat, guess what happens? All of a sudden, I'm up here and my dad's in the back and he's like, hold on. My, my knuckles are turning white. I'm scared to death. And he said, all right, you ready? I lied. Yeah. Okay, so we push off. Have you ever been on a roller coaster? And you know how when a roller coaster first takes off and you've got that adrenaline rush? We get out in the channel of water and take off. And I look around the bend and I said, Dad, look out. There's a tree that had fallen across the width of the creek. It's a giant sycamore tree, the little gumball things on the sycamore. It has blocked the entire width of the creek. And this is not looking good. And so, again, no life jackets, right? No brains either. So we come around, and I said, Dad. And he said, hold on. We plowed into the tree, full force. Well, now all the water is trying to come over the back of the boat. So my dad, with all the weight, is at the back of the boat. The, the water's coming in. Well, now the boat's going lower and lower and lower. And all of a sudden, force flips the boat. I go out of the top of it like some rag doll. I get swept under where the boat was. Boat's gone. Boat's downstream. I am now pinned up against the tree. I'm holding my breath. We used to have a pool in the backyard, so I'd practice holding my breath underwater. I think I could max out at about a minute, right? I, I, it was all I could do to hold on my breath. And uh, my whole life flashed before my eyes. You're probably thinking, nine years old, you know, your whole life, well, it doesn't take long when you're nine. And so I'm thinking, this is it. And I'm gonna die. And all of a sudden, I, I can barely see, <coughs> the water's kind of murky, I can see my dad up there, Somehow, God's kindness, I got free. I came up to the surface, <gasps> took a huge breath, and my dad reached down, and he said, Rich, are you all right? I said, Dad, I'm scared. I started to cry. He said, you're scared. <laughs> He's thinking about facing my mother, who's back on shore, right? <laughs> he 
my dad had lost a brand new pair of eyeglasses, gone, swept down the creek, a uh, rowboat, gone, and he thought his son was gone. You talk about not a good day, right? And there's a reason I'm telling you this story, because at the time, I did not know the Lord as my Savior. And I got thinking about, what would have happened to me if I died in the creek? So let me fast forward. About six months later, my dad, um, my dad had been led to Christ by a man that he worked with, and the man brought his Bible to, to work every day. He was my dad's boss. One day my dad, I lost his temper. I think he said some bad word. And his boss said, Dick, aren't you tired of being a sinner? And my dad said, yeah, well, actually, I am. He said, could we talk during lunch? And he pulled out his Bible, and he went through the plan of salvation. And um, I'm, I'm Rich Tozer. My dad was Dick Tozer. He's Dick, Richard Sr. He said, Dick, would you like to receive the Lord as your Savior? He said, I would, Well. And my dad trusted Christ at the workplace. He thought, why is my church not telling me this? You ought to be hearing about Christ at church, right? So he thought, we, we got to go find a church where they preach this. Well, this is six months or so after I almost drowned. We, we visit a church called Open Bible Baptist Church in New Jersey. Now, you'd think with a name like that, they would open the Bible, right? They did. And so I remember it's a long auditorium. They ran about 1,000 people on a Sunday morning. And the pastor got up. He had on a suit and tie. I was used to the black robe and the collar, no Bible. The pastor had a suit and tie and a Bible. And he says, all right, open your Bibles with me. And have you ever heard when 1,000 people are doing this, trying to find a place? It makes quite a noise, right? So my two sisters are sitting beside my parents. And when the pages started turning, they said, psst, mom, dad, is it raining? What's that noise? <laughs> they had never heard the Bible being opened in church. Wow. Can you imagine that? And I don't know what the pastor preached that, way, that, that day. It was a salvation message. But I remember long after church was over, my dad came into my room. He had his Bible in hand. He said, Richie, I want to talk to you about something. Now think about this. If you go to a church where your dad does not preach the Bible, I'm sorry, your church does not preach the Bible, and now your dad walks into your room and he's got a Bible, what would you be thinking? I've done something bad, and my dad found out about it, right? He said, but I want you to sit down for a minute. I want to talk to you about something. He said, Rich, have you ever sinned? Oh, now I'm sure I've done something bad, right? Uh, yeah, yes, Dad. He said, do you know what sin is? Uh, like murder and stealing. He said, well, yeah, those are sins. But he said, can you think of things you've done that are wrong? Uh, yes, sir, I've lied. I've uh, talked back to you and Mom. I've gotten fights with my sisters. I've said bad words. Man, I'd even use God's name like a cuss word. You know, it's amazing. I knew all that stuff was bad, but until that moment, I'd never thought about it as sin against God before. But all of a sudden, I'm realizing these are sins I've committed against God. And my dad said, yeah, see, Rich, this is what I want to talk to you about, what we heard in church today. Have you ever thought about what's going to happen when you die? Yeah, Dad, remember a couple months ago when you took me in the rowboat? He said, yeah, I thought about that today. <laughs> he said, Rich, what would have happened if you'd have drowned? I don't know, Dad. He said, that's what I want to talk to you about. And he opened up to this passage in John chapter 3. Now, for you guys, this is so familiar. But what I'd like you to pretend for a minute. Imagine you're a 10-year-old boy who's never heard this passage before. I want to read from verse 1. I want you to follow along with me, okay? So just pretend. Pretend you've never heard this before. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said to thee, You must be born again. Now I'll stop there for right now. So my dad said, Okay, Rich, this man, Nicodemus, was one of the most religious men of his day. 
In fact, I didn't know this until later, Nicodemus was considered the chief teacher of the Sanhedrin, the, the governing 70 elders of Israel, and he's probably the preeminent teacher of the day. So here's a guy, well qualified, and he comes to Jesus after hours late one time, and he says, you've got to be from God. These miracles validate it. You, your claims, you, you have to be from God. I know there's common opinion that's opposed to you, but I, I, I believe you're from God. Interesting, Jesus doesn't even engage in polite conversation. He goes right to the core message of Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is scratching his head. How can it born again? How can a man be born when he's old? So let me just stop there. My dad said, now, Rich, this is a very religious man. And the Lord said to him, if you don't get born again, Nicodemus, you won't even see the kingdom of God. He said, Rich, if being good, being good could get you to heaven, why did Jesus say that to this man? He said, see, you can't get to heaven being religious. He said, what dawned on me last year when you almost drowned a few months ago, we've been in church all our lives. But think about this, gang. If going to church could get you to heaven, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? If being part of a youth group could get you to heaven, why would Jesus have to suffer like he did? My dad said this, here's the problem, son. One of the verses in the Bible is the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, Rich, you and I just talked about sin. Here's the problem, Rich. Your sin separates you from God. And he asked me this, and, and you guys can interact with me, okay? When I ask for interaction, I'll let you know. I want you to give me some feedback. He said to me, hey, Rich, where does God live? And folks, where, where, did, where did I say? Where does God live? Heaven, yeah, I knew that. Okay, even as a non-Bible preaching church-going kid, I knew that. I said, he lives in heaven, Dad. He said, so here's the deal, Rich. If you die separated from God... That means you could not go where? Heaven. There's a scripture, Isaiah 59, 2 says, your iniquities, another word for sins, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear, Isaiah 59, 2. So if you die separated from God and he's in heaven, you can't go there. It's kind of like during COVID, they weren't letting people in hospitals who, you know, had COVID because obviously they don't want to spread it. Um, so the idea of, you know, trying to keep away from people, okay, well, that, that kind of made some sense. But here's the problem. If you go to heaven and you have a condition called sin, heaven wouldn't be heaven anymore. So sin separates you from God. So somehow you got to get the sin taken away. And my dad said, Richie, what did God do to take away your sin? It's like the lights came on. Like, did you ever play Connect the Dots when you were a kid? How many of you ever did Connect the Dots? Okay, so you know when you first start, you're like seven, eight. You don't know what the number, nah, you don't know what the picture is. But you get around to like 42, 43, and like, oh yeah, it's a pirate ship, or you know, whatever it is. Okay, all of a sudden you're connecting the dots. I was connecting the dots for the first time in my life. My dad took me down to verse 16. And you all know this. I mean, you could quote this in your sleep. But again... Pretend with me for a minute, you're the kid hearing this for the first time in your life. Would you look at this verse, not just spouting it off by memory, think about every word, because as in that moment of time, I'm hearing this for the first time ever. Can you imagine being 10 and you've never heard this? Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My dad said, what did God do to take away your sins? Jesus died on the cross, Dad. That's right. Why did he die on the cross? Well, it says here that if I believe in him, I wouldn't perish. What's that mean? Dad had asked me this. If you die separated from God, where would you go? I didn't want to say it because I'd only heard people use it like a cuss word. Again, our church didn't preach the Bible. So I, I pointed downward like this, and he said, well, yes, Rich, there is a place called hell, and we're not cussing when we talk about it in context. He said, and here's the problem. If you die separated from God, you would go to hell. I said, Dad, I don't want to go there. He said, well, I don't want you to go there either. But he said, thankfully, God doesn't want you to go there. And so what did God do? 
believe on him, would not perish. He said, what did Jesus do to pay for your sins? And it's like the lights came on. He died on the cross. In fact, look at verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. Isn't that interesting? In John chapter 3, you have two of the most important words concerning salvation. The term saved and the term born again. And who was the one that coined those terms? Who came up with those terms? Jesus did. Believe on him, you'll be saved. Interesting, sometimes people say, well, you Christians, you're all so narrow-minded. It's like you either have to accept Jesus or God will send you to hell. Well, let me explain something. That's not exactly what the Bible said. Huh? You're not going to go wishy-washy on the gospel. Oh, no. No, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. But listen to how people will phrase this with you. Oh, you're Christians. You all, you either accept Jesus or God will send you to hell. Oh, no. No. You and I are already on our way to hell. That's why God sent Jesus to save us. See, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. Imagine if you're traveling by ferry boat, uh, one of the Great Lakes. Let's say you're on your way out to Mackinac Island, and all of a sudden you get hit by a wave, and the ferry boat lurches, and you get tossed overboard. And you know, on the side of the ferry boat, they have those life rings. And so somebody grabs the life preserver and throws it to you. You're struggling with the waves. Okay, what's the idea of the life preserver? You grab on, they'll pull you in, you'll be saved, right? Here's what does not happen if you ever get swept over a wave off a ferry boat. Nobody throws the life preserver and then grabs a rifle with a scope on it and points the scope at you. All right, now grab the life preserver. I'm going to shoot you. That would be a contradictory action, right? <laughs> Throwing the life preserver is meant to do what? Save you, right. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He sent his son into the world to save the world. He did not say, all right, you all either accept Jesus or I'm going to send you to hell. Folks, we've already gone overboard. We're already lost in our sin. God sending Jesus to this world was an act of love and compassion. He sent him that you might be saved. Principle number one I want you to get is salvation. Okay, I told you I'm going to give you several today. and I'll give you a key word or phrase. I'll give you the key reference, and then I will give you a summary statement. Okay, so the key word here is salvation. The text is John 3, 1 through 18. In fact, I didn't read 18 yet. Let's look at that one. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, so my dad said to me, Rich, you know that Jesus died on the cross, but have you ever accepted him? I said, no. He said, here's what John 1, 12 tells us. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What does that mean, as many as received him? You have to accept him by faith. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I'm sure you've heard this illustration before, but let's say um, I've, I've got a tract here, and let's say I want to give it to somebody. What's your name? Anna? So Anna... I'm going to give you this, okay, as an illustration. You can keep it, too, when I give it to you. But if I said, hey, Anna, I want you to have this. I, I can offer it to Anna all day, but she doesn't have to take it, right? So when does that become yours, Anna? When yeah, when you took it, right? So I didn't make her take it, but she, you know, she doesn't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody. So she's like, yeah, I'll take it. Okay, now she had to ex actually take it out of my hands and put it in her hands. There had to be an exchange, right? By faith, there's got to be a point that you put your trust in Jesus Christ. It's nothing you do that saves you. It's just your total trust in Him that saves you. But it's interesting. My dad asked me when uh, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world. What does he mean there? Right? There's another verse that says, love not the world. Well, God loved the world. What? Well, one is the world's system, all the sin, the evil in the world. Don't love that. But when my dad asked me when it says God loved the world, what's that mean? I said, the people. He said, right. And who are the people? I said, well, all of us. He said, Rich, think of this. If you were the only person in the world, the Lord would have done this for you. Put your name in there. You know, God so loved Rich. God so loved Anna. Put your name in there. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. Would you like to accept Christ as your Savior? I said, yes, Dad. What do I do? Well, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the word call in Romans 10, 13, that's like a cry of desperate dependence. It's like a kid's been lost in the woods and they send out a search team. And let's say, you know, his name's Billy. Billy! Billy! And he's been in the woods all night, scared to death. And all of a sudden he hears his name. 
He says, I'm over here! Why, why does he cry out? Because he's lost and he doesn't know how to get home himself. He's dependent upon somebody else to rescue him. That's what the scripture means. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not going through confirmation class like I did when I was a kid in the Methodist church. It's putting your trust in the Lord to save you. And I'll, I'll never forget, I knelt down by my bed and um, I had a little twin bed there. My dad sitting beside me. He said, let's get down and on our knees. He said, why don't you uh, talk to the Lord and then I'll talk to him. You ask him to save you. Now again, I was 10, okay, so that's been a long time ago. I don't remember exactly the words I said, but it was so significant. I can remember to this day, I remember the gist of what I prayed. I got, I got tears welling up in my eyes because see, now I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm in danger of hell. I know I almost died a couple of months ago. And this is serious business. I remember praying along these lines, Dear God, I, I know I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm bad. I've lied and I've talked back to my parents. I've used bad words. I've even used your name like a bad word. I'm sorry, God. I, I believe, I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sins. I believe that after he was buried, he rose again. I believe he's alive. I want to ask, would you please save me? because of what Jesus did for me. In your name, amen. That day was February the 12th of 1977. I was 10 years old. I'm, I'm 56 now, okay? So I was a 10-year-old kid. I trusted the Lord that day, and I will tell you, that single act of faith changed my whole life. Changed not only my future, not only my marriage, my family, changed eternity for me. I want to tell you, God is not willing that any should perish. You might be here thinking, well, you know, that's great for you, and that's just not my thing. I don't even believe in God. Let me, let me tell you, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there's no God. It's absurdity for you to act as if there's no God. And what I know is even as I'm preaching this to you, young person, the Lord's drawing you to himself. He works in your heart to pull you to himself. He wants you to know. In fact, here's the summary statement, okay? So I gave you uh, salvation. I gave you John 3, 1 through 18. Here's the summary sentence. Christianity is not religion. It's a relationship with Christ. Christianity is not religion. It's a relationship with Christ. John 17, verse 3, Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, said uh, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That, that was his purpose for coming, that they might know thee, they can know you. Let me ask you, do you know God? A lot of people say, oh yeah, I know God. Listen, Jesus said on the day of judgment, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I'll profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's in Matthew 7, verse 22 and 23. Depart from me, I never knew you. Look, going to heaven is not a matter of what you do. Going to, matter, going to heaven will be a matter of whom you knew. Did you know the Lord as Savior? Not what you do, but whom you knew. Did you know Him as your Savior? You must be born again. And I will say of everything else we're going to cover this morning, this is the bedrock to everything. If, if you don't yet have a personal relationship with the Lord, I'm urging you. In fact, I'm pleading with you, come to Christ. He wants to save you. The prophet Isaiah said, look unto me and be saved. And that's looking at Jesus to, to be your Savior. I, you don't even have to wait till I'm done. You don't have to wait till I give an invitation. While I'm still going on in my message here, you could bow your head. You could pray from your heart. You don't even have to audibleize it. God can hear you from your mind and say, Lord, I'm a rotten sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And I do believe that Jesus died for me. And I believe that he rose again. I mean, when I was 10, I'm thinking if he can create the world, how hard is it to rise from the dead, right? I believe you rose again, and I'm asking you would save me because of what you did for me. Repent of your sin. Repent means realize you're a guilty, rotten sinner. There's nothing you can do to justify yourself or make you right. Repent and simply rely on Jesus Christ. Put your trust in Him. Believe that He died, was buried, rose again, paid in full. That day in February of 77 changed my life. And today... 2023, this day, May 6th, 2023, could be the day you know the Lord as Savior, and I sure pray you will. 
I want to go one more place with you before we finish up this session. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5 with me. 1 Peter chapter 5. I'd love to tell you that from that point, everything was great, you know, and now no trouble in my life. But I, I will tell you this. <clears throat> we remained in our Methodist church for the next uh, four years. My parents thought, we got to find a church in our denomination that preaches like that, that Baptist church we visited. Well, to be fair, there are some Methodists out there who still preach the Bible. They're, they're not a ton of them anymore, sadly. Um, but sometimes we hear a Baptist preacher, we think they just bust on everybody else. Let me, let me tell you, there are a lot of Baptists who don't preach the Bible anymore, and if they don't, I wouldn't belong to their church. Uh, I'm a Baptist, but it's not being a Baptist that gets me to heaven. The first concern is their loyalty to the Bible and what they believe about Jesus Christ. So I'm not here to pick on everybody else's church just for the sake of picking on church, but I will tell you this, if any church is not preaching the Bible, and if they're not telling you how to be saved, and they're not telling you how to, how to walk with God, they're not telling you the truth, and you should leave that church. So my parents thought, well, we've been Methodist our whole lives, we're going to find another Methodist church. Well, for four years they looked around, and we, we couldn't find one in southern New Jersey and in Philadelphia area of Pennsylvania. We couldn't find a church that was preaching the Bible. And finally, my parents thought, man, we need to leave this church. We've got to go find somewhere they're preaching the Word. Well, I'd been saved at age 10, but here's the problem. The Great Commission wasn't just get people saved. It says, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, but Matthew says, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all, even to the end of the world. Amen. That's in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. The Great Commission is to get people discipled. Well, I hadn't been taught anything other than salvation. So I'm in public school in New Jersey in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and I am, I am not getting any Bible at church. In fact, I remember being introduced to rock music in my public school. And back in the 80s, there was some pretty heavy stuff. One day we had music appreciation in our class. And our teacher said, okay, tomorrow, Music Appreciation Day, everybody bring your favorite style of music. And back then, everything was on vinyls, okay? LPs, have you all ever seen vinyls? Okay, they're making a comeback now. In fact, more vinyls sold last year, albums, record albums, than uh, CDs, interesting. So vinyl albums, that's how we listen to everything. I had a paper route, and I used to earn money pitching the newspaper. Well, my teacher's favorite music that day was The Flight of the Bumblebee. Picture the bee flying around the room. I brought in a collection of uh, Looney Tunes music. Da, 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 Bugs Bunny, you know? That's what my dad and I used to watch on Saturday mornings. Highly intellectual. And, uh, and then one of the guys in the group brought in an album from the rock group Queen. They still play this stuff at arenas and stadiums today. We are the champions. We will rock you. I did not know anything about the group, but I liked the beat. That's typically where the hook comes. And so this is not a chapter of my life I love telling about, but I, I got hooked on rock music. So from fourth grade to eighth grade, I listened to rock music every waking hour that I wasn't in school, and I would set my clock at night to play the radio, the local rock station, until I fell asleep at night. I mean, I was addicted to this stuff, and it got pretty dark. I was into groups like ACDC, Van Halen, Led Zeppelin. Now, I didn't get into groups like Kiss and some of the blatantly satanic groups, but I might as well have. You know, the musicians, this is not the preacher's opinion, the musicians will tell you that their, their whole style of music was promoting sex and drugs and rebellion. And so that's, that's what they're telling you. They weren't hiding it, right? Well, I, I didn't agree in, with sex outside of marriage or drugs or, or well, I was being rebellious, but I, I didn't endorse that. I just liked the music. That's the problem. See, we tolerate stuff because we like it. So I got hooked on it. And my parents could tell I was getting darker and darker, and I, I was rebellious toward my parents. So now, I think it was seventh or eighth grade, one day my dad went to discipline me about something, and I punched my dad. Now, in Old Testament Israel, I would have been taken outside and stoned. Okay, now, I had a lot of friends that were stoned when they were young, but that was through marijuana. Okay, we're not talking about that. Um, stoned to death for rebellion. And my dad knew, okay, we got problems in this family. So we found a church nearby, a little Baptist church. They were about 60 people. And we started going there, I mean, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, youth group. So I'm in church like five times a week. 
And so some of the kids are looking at me like, so what kind of music do you listen to? I'm wearing t-shirts that say Led Zeppelin, you know, things like this. And I told them, they're like, don't you know that's bad? Like, bad, that's my music. Well, here, you should read this. And I remember they gave me a comic book from Chick Publications called Spellbound. It was about the origins of the music that I was into. I started getting convicted, right? And my parents took a class. In fact, our church had a Bible institute, and they took a class on how to raise godly children. And they realized they were not raising godly children. And one night at our house, we had family meeting. Did you all ever have family meeting at your house? Seven o'clock, everybody meet in the family room, right? Dun, 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 dun. So we come to the family room, and I said to my two sisters, so what did you do? I'm like, I don't know. What did you do? I, for once, nobody could figure out what we'd done wrong, right? That was rare. So um, I'm the rebel, you know, at this point. And my, my dad gathered everybody. He said, you're probably wondering why we called this meeting. Yeah. He said, well, it's not really about you guys as much as it's about mom and me. And I thought, oh, no. You know, I'd heard of other parents going through divorce or my parents going through, no, they didn't. My, my parents had a great marriage. But they said, look, kids, we have failed you and we failed God. My dad, six, seven, tears coming down his face said, we've been wrong and we want to ask you to forgive us. Ooh, it's a big step. Your parents are asking you to forgive them. Will you forgive us? Yes, mom. Yes, dad. And I honestly, I wasn't sure I wanted to say yes because I, I said, well, if I say yes, we forgive you, isn't that admitting that I'm a failure? <laughs> because, you know, they're telling us they raise bad kids, so am I not admitting that I'm a bad kid? But I was a bad kid, and I knew I couldn't get around it. So we said, yes, we forgive you. And my dad said, look, we've been taking this class on how to raise a family, and we want to tell you, we have not done it God's way. But here's what's happened. Mom and I have gotten convicted, and we've decided from now on, whatever the Bible says, that's what we're doing. We're going to go with what God tells us. And listen, it's not going to be easy for any of us, but we are going to make this change. You've seen we're in church now. In fact, I'd, I'd seen my parents get baptized as adults. You know, we were all sprinkled as babies in the Methodist church. I saw my parents get baptized, believers baptism. They said, whatever the Bible says, we're doing it. And I remember I was uh, 15. Who's 15 in here? Anybody 15 years old? Okay. What's your name, bud? Tucker, I'm going to look at you for a minute like you're me, okay? So my dad looks at me. I'm almost 15. He said, now, Rich, we think it's too late for you, but we're going to try anyway. <laughs> Man, I'm thinking drug rehab. I hadn't even tried drugs, you know? I'm thinking reform, reform school. I didn't, even have an, I didn't even have a rap sheet. I haven't gotten arrested for anything. What? And my dad was just telling the truth. He said, we think it's too late for you because I'm a heavy metal headbanger. Rebel, I thought you got saved. Yeah, I did, but I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to grow. And so now there's this internal struggle going on, and I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit just tore me up with conviction that day. And God totally turned our family around. I had to turn to 1 Peter 5. Look up, starting in verse 5 with me. The, the second key word I want you to get in this series is, is the word submissiveness. Sub, miss, M-I-S-S, -S, submissiveness. Now, I could have used the word submission. Submission is an action. Submissiveness is an attitude. I want to focus on the attitude, submissiveness. So look at uh, verse 5 here. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. See the word submit, get under authority. Yea, all of you be subject. That's a synonym for submit. Be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. That's humbleness. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Look, I was saved, but Satan was looking to destroy any testimony, any influence that I might have in my life. And so... Interesting, the word submissiveness. Here's the summary uh, sentence I want to give you. God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. When I tell that story about my uh, parents turning things around, I've, I know sometimes parents think, I'll tell you what, if I ever did blow it, I wouldn't admit it to my kids. And, and parents, listen, that's the biggest mistake we'll ever make. God gives grace to the humble. 
I really believe when my mom and dad humbled themselves, that's how God was able to get a hold of our heart. You know, for us preachers, we're to be blameless, but blameless doesn't mean we're sinless. When was the last time you went to somebody and said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? I remember one time, I think, Tim, when you were up in Michigan, we were doing the Round Robin Missions Conference way back when, you know, and you were in, you were in um, Rosebush. And so there were five different churches every night. And I was staying over in uh, Denver to Kaiser's Church, and who's in Angola now, but uh, he was up there. And I remember I'm on my way to uh, Cadillac, Michigan, or Manton, and I'm trying to prep this message. It's new. And my little daughter, Brianna, turned 27 this week. She's in the back seat, jabbering away. And I, I was trying to focus. And I said, Brianna, shh. My wife's driving, and I'm just prepping. And Brianna kept jabbering away. And finally, I turned around and said, Brianna, will you please stop? And she started crying. My wife said, oh, great. Prepare to preach to the masses, honey. You just chewed your child's head off. <laughs> and uh, we, we just pulled up at the church at the moment. The pastor's looking out waiting to greet us, and my daughter's crying, and now I'm crying, like, oh, man, because I t this poor little kid, you know, she don't know what she's doing. And the pastor waits, I'm like, give me just a minute, and I have to go out and say, Brianna, I'm sorry. Daddy was wrong. I was impatient. I was being, that was just wrong. Will you please forgive me? Yes, Daddy. You know, think, how are you going to preach after that? Well, I'll tell you what, the Lord was gracious. We, he worked that night. Did I deserve for him to work that night? No, I never deserve for him to work. But he's good despite us. And the principle is God gives grace to the humble. Now, I'm not, please don't think, oh, wow, you're proud of your humility. That would be self-defeating, right? No, I'm just admitting my own faults. I've had to do that many times and go back and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? You know, that's a fair question for you guys, though. When was the last time you went back to somebody and said, I was wrong? Will you please forgive me? And I will tell you, I went to my parents later and said, Mom, Dad, I've been rebellious. I've been wrong. I remember a Sunday school teacher said, you guys ought to tell your mom and dad every day that you love them. And then he told a story about a young man who told his parents one time, I wish you'd just drop dead. And they both died in a car accident. He never saw them again. That's the last thing he ever said to his parents. And he regretted it the rest of his life. He said, you don't want to be that person. He said, you want it to be that the last thing you ever said to your parents was, I love you. And I remember in 2008, I got the phone call. My dad died suddenly at age 65, unexpected health emergency. And I thought back, what's the last thing I said to my dad? I love you. Because every time we talked, the last thing I'd say, well, dad, hey, I love you. My dad was my best man in my wedding. What a difference. And you knew who changed the rebel's heart? God did. God gives grace to the humble. Well, if my parents would just change, yeah, how about you let God change you and then let him work on them? It's interesting in the Bible when somebody does something wrong, you know what you're supposed to do? If they've wronged you, you know what the Bible says? Go to them and get it right. And what does he say if you wrong somebody else? Go to them and get it right. Huh! <laughs> How come it always falls on me? Okay, I get it. If I do wrong, I should go make up with them. But if they do wrong, I'm supposed to approach them? Why does it come back to me? If we all wait for the other guy to do it, nobody will ever do it. I'm responsible. And God gives grace to the humble. Close your Bibles if you would, and I want you to bow your head with me. You've listened really well. So we got two key principles, salvation and submissiveness. Father, I can deliver the news. That's a privilege. It's a job I love doing. But I can't save anybody. I can only tell them how to be saved. But that's your department. Saving people is what you do. Same with sanctifying people. I can tell them the truth, but the Lord Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I can deliver the truth, but I don't sanctify anybody. That's your work, and I know that. Please do a work in our hearts. Our heads are bowed. I want to ask you this. How many of you can say, you know, Brother Rich, I know there's a time in my life that I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there came a point of being saved. And maybe you've doubted it at times. Maybe you've gone through struggles. But you say, you know, I, I've, I've settled this in my heart. I'm not getting to heaven based on what I do. I've put my trust in Jesus Christ alone. 
and I know that he saved me. Would you hold up your hand and you say, yes, I have trusted the Lord as my Savior. And thank God, I know I'm saved. Amen. Lots and lots of hands. Okay, let me put them down. Let me ask you, how many of you have ever doubted your salvation? I know I have, and I'll talk about it in the next session. Anybody ever go through doubts? Yeah. Okay, you can put your hands down. Let me ask you this. Is there anybody today? You'd have to say either... I am not saved, and I know that. Or I don't really know if I'm saved. And that's a problem too. Is there anybody in either of those categories? Please pray for me. I really don't know if I'm saved, or frankly, I, I know I've never put my trust in Christ, and that's a problem. Is there anybody like that? Pray for me. Okay, I'm looking around. And some of you that have grown up in church and maybe have heard the Bible, we would love praying with you. We want to help you. Okay, you can put your hand down. I saw one person. Is there anybody else? Pray for me. I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've been born again. And sometimes you think, well, what are people going to think? You know, really, who cares what people think? When you stand before God, you're not standing there with your peer group. You're not standing there with your friends. It's you and God on that day. He doesn't want to meet you as a judge. He wants to welcome you home as your father. How many of you would say this? I've got friends or family. I've got people I know that don't know the Lord. And just like your dad cared enough to tell you, God was convicted in my heart. I need to speak to maybe a brother or sister about the Lord. I need to speak to a neighbor about the Lord. There's somebody I know. Brother Rich, God was speaking to my heart while you were talking. There's some people I need to speak to about Christ. Would you hold up your hand? I was thinking that when you were preaching. I, I, there's somebody i got to tell about this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to pray that God will give you grace and opportunity. One more before we close out this first session. God gives grace to the humble. Who was convicted and said, God brought a specific incident to my mind or a specific person to my mind I know that I need to humble myself. Pray for me. I want to obey God in that principle. Would you hold up your hand? You said I needed that. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's stand together, okay, with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm not going to give a come forward invitation yet in this first session, but I'm going to have our pianist play. And there is room in your pew there. I just give you an opportunity to turn right there and kneel at your pew and say, God, you worked in my heart about this, and I want to be responsive to you. Would you do that as we finish up? Lord, you worked in my heart, and I want to be tender to you. I want to respond to you about this, whatever the conviction was. You know, it's interesting. He says, draw an eye to God, and he'll draw an eye to you. Let God have his way in your heart as he's convicting you. You say, Lord, I've been out of fellowship with you. I've been wandering away. Please work in me. Draw me back. I know you said you'll never leave me mean or forsake me, and that's true. But I just feel like I've, I've moved. I've moved away from fellowship. And I need your work. She's going to play through one more stanza. Brother Ryan's coming to give us the next step here. But I, you take time. And why don't you ask the Lord, I know there are more principles to come today, Lord, what do you want to speak to me about? Where do you want me to change? message brother rich if you're here and you do not know christ as savior please find someone to talk to we don't want you leaving here without knowing for sure you're on your way 
to heaven. So next up on our agenda is lunch. It's just right in the fellowship hall. So go left out of here and go through those doors. So I'm going to go ahead and pray. And then girls, you'll go first. And then guys, follow in after. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. And again, Lord, I just want to pray for if there's anyone here who does not know you, that today will be the day of their salvation. And Lord, I pray if um, you would just give them the courage and the grace to talk to someone, Lord, about it. And Lord, I pray that you just uh, bless this food and bless our next, um, bless the rest of the day, Lord. I pray that everything just brings you honor and glory. We pray for these things in your son's name. Amen.